Good morning. Welcome to worship this 18th Sunday after Pentecost. For those of you visiting with us today, I am Frank Harpster. I'm the senior pastor at St. Peter's Lutheran Church in Ocean City, Maryland, and we thank you for worshiping with us today. It is good that we can all worship safely from our own locations until we can gather together again in person. Let's take a moment now and quiet our hearts and our minds and turn our attention to the Lord that we come to worship this day. We gather in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But when we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word and deed, by what we have done, and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for us, and for his sake, forgives us all our sin. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sin, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Every single moment that I'm with you is like 
no other, no other. I've never seen a lover who is quite like you. There's no other, no other. In every single moment that I've been through, he's like no other. Jesus, you are my great reward. You are the prize worth living for. So I'll trade. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Beloved God, from you come all things that are good. Lead us by the inspiration of your Spirit to know those things that are right, and by your merciful guidance, help us to do them. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Our worship continues as we hear God's holy word for this day. The first reading for this, the 18th Sunday after Pentecost, comes to us from the fifth chapter of the prophet Isaiah. An introduction to this reading is as follows. The prophet sings a sad parable-like love song about the relationship between God and Israel. In this song, Israel is compared to a promising vineyard. Despite God's loving care, the vineyard, that is Israel, has brought forth wild grapes of injustice and distress when fine grapes of justice and righteousness were expected. And now the reading. <clears throat> Let me sing for my beloved my love song concerning this vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed out a wine vat in it. He expected it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. And now, inhabitants of Jerusalem and people of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? When I expected it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? Now I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge, and it shall be devoured. I will break down its wall, and it shall be trampled down. I will make it a waste. It shall not be pruned or hoed, and it shall be overgrown with briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds, and that they rain no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the people of Judah are his pleasant planting. He expected justice, but saw bloodshed, righteousness, but heard a cry. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Restore us, O God of hosts. Let your face shine upon us, and we shall be saved. You have brought a vine out of Egypt. You cast out the nations and planted it. You cleared the ground for it. It took root and filled the land. The mountains were covered by its shadow. 
and the towering cedar trees by its boughs. You stretched out its tendrils to the sea and its branches to the river. Why have you broken down its wall so that all who pass by pluck off its grapes? The wild boar of the forest has ravaged it, and the beasts of the field have grazed upon it. Turn now, O God of hosts, look down from heaven. Behold and tend to this vine. Preserve what your right hand has planted. The second lesson for this, the 18th Sunday after Pentecost, comes to us from the third chapter of Paul's letter to the Philippians. An introduction is as follows. Paul reviews some of his supposed credentials, which no longer have any bearing in comparison to the right relationship he has been given through the death of Christ power of Christ's resurrection motivates him to press on toward the ultimate goal, eternal life with Christ. Now the reading. Paul writes, If anyone else has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, as to the law a Pharisee, as to zeal a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law blameless. Yet, whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as loss because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law but one that comes through faith in Christ. The power is what I want, the righteousness from God based on faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death, if somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this or have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. Word of God, word of life, thanks be to God. Hear now the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said to the people, Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to tenants and went to another country. When the harvest time had come, he sent his servants to the tenants to collect his produce. But the tenants seized his servants and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again he sent other servants, more than the first, and they treated him the same way. Finally, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir. 
Come, let us kill him and get his inheritance. So they seized him, threw him out of the vineyard, and killed him. Now when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They said to him, he will put those wretches to a miserable death and lease the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the produce at the harvest time. Jesus said to them, have you never read in the scriptures the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? This is the Lord's doing, and it is amazing in your eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to the people that produce the fruits of the kingdom. The one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, and it will crush everyone on whom it falls. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard this parable, they realized that he was speaking about them. They wanted to arrest him, but they feared the crowds because the crowds regarded him as a prophet. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each and every heart be pleasing and acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. In 1939, a man named John Steinbach published a book that is still shared in English classes today. Some 61 years later, this book is The Grapes of Wrath. This morning, we are sharing other well-known stories that could very well be titled The Grapes of Wrath. And these stories were written thousands of years ago and are still very important and meaningful in our faith journey and in our lives. Our gospel reading this morning shares a third parable of Jesus about a vineyard. The first parable we heard two weeks ago. Remember the owner of the vineyard went out hiring workers at 9 a.m. and noon and late afternoon and at the end of the day? And he paid each the same wages, regardless of when they began working. And why did he do that? Because the reason they were even in the vineyard and the reward they received was not of their own doing, but of the goodness and grace of the owner. That parable reminds us that we too are recipients of God's goodness and grace. And we receive God's mercy, not because of what we do, but because of what Jesus Christ did, because of God's grace and love for us. We then are empowered to respond to that grace and mercy and love by doing good works, by sharing what we are blessed with. In the second parable that Pastor Harry read last week, it was about a vineyard, an owner, and two sons. The one son said that he would do what the father asked, but he didn't. The other son refused to do what the father asked, but changed his mind and changed his heart, and he did it. This parable lifts up two very powerful lessons for our faith journey and for our lives. The first is that God doesn't want lip service from us. We are expected to do what God calls us and empowers us to do not to achieve God's grace, mercy, and love, but as our response to those gifts already given us. That is how we live out our belief. The other lesson in that parable is that God's grace, mercy, and love are endless, are everlasting. And every time we fall short, every time we fall down, every time we get it wrong, every time we screw up, every time we turn away and say no, God's grace and mercy and love forgives us and gives us another chance. And the Holy Spirit works in, through, and around us, empowering us to do what God asks. This morning, Jesus tells a parable where instead of hired hands working in the vineyard, instead of the sons tending or not tending to the vineyard for their father, the owner has given the vineyard to tenants or sharecroppers to run. 
the time of the harvest draws near, and he sends his servants to collect his share of the crop, his portion of the grapes. But instead of receiving grapes from, their from the tenants, they receive wrath. They are beaten, whipped, and killed. Learning this, the owner sends another delegation. The scripture says more than the first, but that doesn't necessarily mean a larger group, but a group of men with more authority. This time he sent the managers or the foremen, if you will. But again, no grapes only more wrath. So now the owner says to himself, I will send my own son. They will no doubt know who he is, his position, his authority, his right to demand and collect my share of the crop. They will listen to him, he thinks. The owner was right, partially. The tenants know who he is. This is the son, they say. But do they turn over the grapes? No. The son did not receive the grapes. He too received the wrath, their self-centeredness, their greed. They begin to reason, although in a very warped way, he will inherit the vineyard. If we kill him, it will be ours. How would that ever be? Sure, the son would be dead, and he would no longer be there to receive the father's inheritance. But how would that put them, outsiders and strangers, next in line to inherit? Even if the owner of the vineyard had no other relatives, he surely was not going to give everything he had to those who killed his servants and killed his son. At the conclusion of the parable, Jesus asked the question, what will the Lord of the vineyard do? They respond, he will kill those wicked tenants and turn the vineyard to others who will give him their fruit in due season. This parable of the grapes of wrath has similarities to our first reading from Isaiah that Pastor Harry shared with us. Isaiah's vineyard was also planted by the owner. It had a watchtower and a wine vat. In Jesus' parable, the master planted the vineyard, fenced it, put a wine press, and built a tower. When the master of the vineyard and the parable sent servants to receive the grapes, they did not receive grapes, but wrath. In Isaiah's song of the vineyard, the beloved owner went looking for grapes. But the vineyard did not yield grapes. Isaiah's vineyard produced only wild grapes. Grapes not of justice or righteousness, but of outcry and bloodshed. And it was the tenants in the parable who cried out. And from their wrath, there was bloodshed. Isaiah's song of the vineyard was about the people of Israel and their disobedience and rejection to God and God's ways. Jesus' parable is directed to the Pharisees and the Sadducees, to the religious leaders of his day. They had been placed in charge of Israel. They were to be God's representatives. They were to watch over Israel, teaching them God's truth. God's ways, God's love, but they did not. And when the son came, Jesus, they rejected him. And so Christ says, the kingdom will be taken away from you and handed over to others. Think about this for a minute. Isaiah is about the Old Testament Israel. The parable in Matthew is about the Pharisees and Sadducees. What do either have to do with us? How does the parable apply to you and me? How does it apply to the church? We are tenants in God's vineyard. That is all of creation. It has been given to us to enjoy and to care for and to share. Just like the vineyards in our readings did not belong to the tenants, they belong to the master. God's vineyard, this amazing world that we live in, does not belong to us. 
We are the tenants. We are the caretakers. As Psalm 24 reminds us, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The tenants in our story did as they pleased. They kept the grapes for themselves. How often do we mirror their behavior? How often do we do as we please? How often do we make our own rules? Do what we want. Worry more about what we think, what we want, what we feel. Inspired by greed and not grace. We are always wanting more. More and more. That's what our society teaches us. The master of the vineyard had every right when the wicked tenants beat and killed his servants to be wrathful and destroy them then and there. But he was patient. Then he sent his foremen and managers who were also killed. But the master withheld his wrath and he sent his son. God has been and continues to be patient and gracious with us. He sent his prophets. He sent his apostles. And he sent his son, Jesus Christ. Like the wicked tenants who murdered the son of the master, we murdered the son of God. The sin, the guilt, the shame, the rebellion, the hatred, the brokenness of you and I, of all of humanity... Nail Jesus to that cross. The grapes of our wrath, as those of Isaiah, were full of outcry. Crucify him! Crucify him! And they yielded not wine, but bloodshed. The death of the master's son did not save the wicked tenants. They did not inherit the vineyard as they hoped. But by the grace, mercy, love, and forgiveness of God, we do. Through the death of Jesus Christ at our hands, at the hands of all humanity, we who were outsiders and strangers have received not the grapes of wrath do us, but the grapes of love and life. We have inherited the kingdom of God. Not because of what we did, but because of what Jesus Christ did. Because of God's grace, mercy, and love. The people responded to Jesus' parable. He will give the vineyard to others who will give him fruits in due season. And it is God who gives us fruits in due season. Psalm 145, 15 confirms, The eyes of all wait upon you, O Lord, and you give them fruit in due season. You open your hand and satisfy the desires of every living thing. Christ drank the cup of grapes of wrath for us. He opened his arms for us. And stretch them out on a cross. He is the life of every living thing. The people's answer was that God would give the vineyard to tenants who would turn over the grapes of love and life. Jesus, however, in his words of judgment to the leadership, says that God will hand over the vineyard, the kingdom, over to the people who will produce its fruit. Did you hear the difference? Not to the people who hand over the fruit, but to the people who produce the fruit. As Christians, we are called and empowered to bear the fruits of God. We are to be the branches in the vineyard, grafted to Christ, the true vine. Jesus bore all our grapes of wrath so that we can bear grapes of love and life. Grapes that will last now and through eternity. Christ died that we may know God's love and have life, life everlasting. 
How are we living out our call as tenants to care for God's creation, to produce those grapes of love and life? How are we using what we are blessed with to bless others? How are we living in and living out God's love with those God puts in our lives? Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Thanks be to God. Amen. Christ is made the sure foundation. Christ our head and Let us profess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. With confidence in God's grace and mercy, let us pray for the church, the world, and all those in need. Holy God, you call us to work for peace and justice in your vineyard. Refresh the church with your life, that we may bear fruit through work and service. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Thank you for the abundant harvest of the earth. Bless and care for those whose hands bring the fruits of the earth to the tables of all who hunger. May we be inspired by your servants who have cared deeply for your creation, especially Francis of Assisi, whom we commemorate today. Protect your creation and help us to preserve it. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. 
curb the impulses of greed and pride that lead us to take advantage of others. Grant that all world, church, and community leaders seek the fruits of the kingdom for the good and welfare of all people. When given the opportunity, lead us to choose candidates who will remember your goodwill and seek your guidance. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Sustain with the promise of new life all who suffer. Assured of your presence, heal our pain and suffering, and equip us to embrace all bodies aching for wholeness of mind, body, and soul. We call to mind those who are struggling today, especially those we name now. Today we lift up the family and friends of Pastor Skip McComas, the family and friends of Betty Franke, Cheryl West, Ann Schneider's Aunt Jenny, Beth Lapone, Michelle, Marilyn, Angela, Lori Dolan Thomas, David, Patrick, and family, Pastor Charles Stump and family, Brenda Shimanent and family, Rue Harper, Joe Smith, Bruce. We lift up all caregivers, first responders, all those working on the front lines to save lives. Ron and Barb Hager, Ann Driscoll, Larry Hager Jr., Leo Tilbury, Ann Hansen, Sherry Pays, Earl Hewitt, Carl Krim, Melissa Williams, Mark Hendrickson, Samara Loss, Jackie Tingle and Son, Scott, Nancy, Jacoby, Carrie, Jacoby, Sonia, Rose, Max, Jody Walensky, Veronica Bona and family, Brenda Robbins and family, Charles and Terry Hutter, Linda Tice, Kathy Baycote and family, Barb and Ron Albright, Jim Stark, Mark Wiley, Lori Frazier, Patty McDermott, Janet Fisher, Rick Latshaw, Sandy, Dina Crabello, Ada Mae Shipley, Sue Shoup, Mary Jo Pollock, Kim Raymond, Pastor Sandra Nyler, Frank Harpster, Robin Shipley, Savannah Bona and family, Marty Schroeder and family, George Edel, Fran Dolan, Peggy Ball, Carol Robinson, Billy and Maddie Carter, Bernie Hartline, Kim Council, Steve Ellis, Janet Ellis, Winanta Lore, Peter. We lift up all caregivers, staff, and residents in assisted living, especially Jen Anderson, Lisa C., Claire Dykeman, Mim Fritz, Bonnie and Will Yuski. We lift up all those serving in the military, especially George Bennett, Justin Carter, Cal Kramer, Katie Kramer, Stephanie DeLuccio, Nicholas Nelbone, David Owens, Joshua Robinson, Nicholas Sorrentino, Ryan Swingler, Kyle Wood. We lift up all missionaries, especially Aaron Ryan. We lift up our bishops, Elizabeth Eaton and Bill Goal. We lift up our partners in ministry, especially St. Stephen's Lutheran Church in Wilmington, Delaware, Pastor Jason Churchill, and Lutheran Campus Ministries in Newark, Delaware, Mindy Holland Chaplin. We lift up our G4 partners, Community Lutheran Church, Faith Lutheran Church, Grace of God Lutheran Church, and Pastor Betty Walensky. We lift up Pastor Mark Malter and his family as they move to their new call in Frostburg, Maryland. And now we lift up those you name out loud or in the quiet of your heart. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all who seek employment. Give hope and a future to those who lack meaningful work, those who have been marginalized or abused in the workplace, and those who desire new opportunities. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Listen as we call on you, O God, and enfold in your loving arms 
all of your children everywhere. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Our worship continues with the offering. While the church building remains closed until it is safe to open it again, the church is still very much open and active and alive. We continue to do what we can during these times to share what we are blessed with, to feed the physically and spiritually hungry in the world. And that's only possible with your continued partnership and support. We ask that you continue to reach out to your brothers and sisters in Christ, to your family, your friends, your neighbors. Reach out whatever ways it's safe to do so, by phone call, text message, social media, pen and paper. Reach out to them. Remind them that they are loved. Remind them that they're not alone. Share what's going on. We also ask for your continued financial support at St. Peter's. There are various ways that you can do that. You can certainly send a check into the church. You can go to our website or Facebook page and click on the donate button. And there are also various apps out there where you can send money to the church. Our ministry of the month is the Cold Weather Shelter. Uh, we are preparing to open that. For those of you who are not aware, we house a cold weather shelter uh, in the winter here in our retreat center, bringing our homeless sisters and brothers off the street. We bring them in for warmth or a place to sleep. We do their laundry. We feed them. We care for them and love them when it's too cold for them to be outside in the weather. We're working on plans now to be able to do that safely in this COVID world. And we ask that you certainly pray for this ministry and for our homeless sisters and brothers. And we ask you to prayerfully consider sending a check into the church marked Cold Weather Shelter to help support our ministry of the month and to help support this very important ministry. Let us pray. Merciful Father, we offer with joy and thanksgiving what you have first given us, ourselves, our time, and our possessions, signs of your gracious love. Receive them for the sake of him who offered himself for us, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Will you join me as we pray together as Jesus has taught us? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. My sisters and brothers in Christ, please always remember that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. God, the Creator, Jesus, the Christ, and the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, bless you and keep you in eternal love. Amen. I'd like to share a few announcements with you before we conclude our worship service. Please know that we're doing everything we can to keep you safe, healthy, spiritually fed, cared for, and connected. If there's anything more we can be doing for you right now, please don't hesitate to let me know. The building remains closed and will be so until we can reopen it again safely. Our hope is that on November 1st, which is All Saints Sunday, we can open the building for a, an in-person worship service. Uh, following all the mandates, and we will keep you posted on how that goes. That, of course, will depend on how the COVID continues to act in our area. Uh, the safe practices, the trends. We have a team in place working on the reopen plan. We're securing all the things that we need to be able to do that. And we will keep you posted as to how and when we will reopen for worship services. 
Again, we hope it'll be able to be November 1st, which is All Saints Sunday. Amy's in the office Monday through Thursday, 8 to 4, and Fridays, 8 to 1. You may call her, email her, or text her. Any correspondence we ask that you send by email or through the postal service. I'm available all the time by phone, text, or email. I'm very blessed to be able to have these opportunities to continue to worship with you outside your homes, and I will keep setting up appointments. If you have not heard from me and you would like one, uh, like me to come and worship with you and share communion with you outside your home, please call the church office and let us know. I'm not sure how much longer the weather is going to hold out to be able to continue to do this uh, through this fall. Remember, you can go to our church website to get the information on our 9 o'clock worship services, our Bible studies on Wednesdays at 10 a.m., and our happy or connection hours on Fridays at 4 p.m., there's also information on there about a G4 Bible study that Pastor Betty is leading on the Psalms. We walk by faith and not by sight with gracious words draw near O oh, Christ who spoke as none e'er spoke my peace be with you here we may not touch your hands and side, nor follow where you trod. But in your promise we rejoice and cry, my Lord and God. For you will resurrect Please know that I love you, your church family loves you, and most of all, God loves you. Let us go in peace to love and serve our Lord and neighbor. Thanks be to God.